now let's kick off my September summary video. One thing I realised was every single month when I'm filming this video, I always tend to apologise for not having read a lot. But the thing with this month is I'm not going to apologise anymore. I'm just going to be like, this is how much I've read. Because actually the really funny thing with me is I could barely read more than 20 minutes in a sitting unless it's like reading a paper for university forces me to do that. And it's compatible with the fact that I really enjoy reading, but I just can't do it for more than 20 minutes in one sitting. So I tend to read in fragments kind of like once or twice throughout the day. Um, I go through stuff really slowly. And I think the upside of it is it really like allows me to relish every single bit of what I'm reading. And that's what I really enjoy. So anyways, let's start with what I covered in September. Albert Camus' The Fall. This was the first book I read this month and I really enjoyed it. I would put it on par with um, Camus' other work, The Stranger, which I also really enjoyed. And I think the really interesting is while Messer is very minimalistic in his um, expression and thoughts, and of course Camus wanted to do that on purpose, um, the protagonist here, Jean-Baptiste, is basically the opposite. He is extremely loquacious, and in fact this entire novel is addressed to a fictional you, and for us it's like ourselves, the reader. And what really happens here is Jean-Baptiste Clemens, refined, handsome, forty, a former successful lawyer, is in turmoil. Over several drunken nights, he regales a chance acquaintance with his story. He talks of his sexual conquests, his debauchery, his love of drinking, dancing, Parisian night, and the agency, and ultimately his self-loathing. This book really acutely reveals the hypocritical modern man in Jean-Baptiste. So his love for honour and grandeur on the outside is juxtaposed against his rotten inside, which in fact disdains others and acknowledges that he really does not care about like being sympathetic or righteous, but merely revels in others' adoration of such facade. And he acknowledges such desire when he says, at every moment of the day, whether I was alone or with other people, I climbed the heights, I lit bonfires up there and heard joyous acclaim rising up towards me, so at least I relished life and my own superiority. And overall, he has a really cynical view of human relationships because he says, I have learned to make do with sympathy. It is easy to come by and it carries no commitment. In the internal monologue, please accept my sympathy comes right before now, let's get on with something else. It's the emotion felt by a prime minister or company chairman. He can achieve after some disaster. Friendship is not easy. It's long and hard to win, but when it's there, you can't get rid of it. You have to make do. Friendship is absent-minded or at least powerless. It cannot achieve what it wants. Perhaps after all, it doesn't want strongly enough. Have you observed that only death awakens our feeling? How we love the friends who have just departed, don't you find? How we admire those of the masters who have just been silenced, their mouths full of dirt. Then our tributes come naturally, tributes that they may have waited all their lives to hear. But do you know why we are always fairer and more generous towards the dead? The reason is simple. We have no obligation where they're concerned. So what he tells us is really that people are a lot more empathetic towards each other than we tend to think and than most people tend to realise. And he gives an example here. There was one man who gave 20 years of his life to a scatterbrained woman, sacrificing everything in his life for her friend's work, even respectability, only to acknowledge one evening that he had never loved her. He was bored, that's all, bored, like most people. So he created from scratch a life of complications and drama for himself. Something's got to happen, that's the explanation for most human undertakings. I think this example here really reminded me of like the protagonist in Catherine Mansfield's story and the link here is to the video where I talked about her stories and the story that I'm mentioning here is called The Men Without a Temperament. It's basically this man who took care of his wife out of responsibility and just obligation and for no reason just because he felt like he had to do it and he felt good on the moral side because he was doing it but he actually loathed his wife. So as I said, Jean-Baptiste tries to tell us that we're more selfish and apathetic and just hypocritical than most of us realise. And he really reveals all these negative traits in himself by saying, We rarely confide in those who are better than we are, rather we avoid their company. Most of the time, on the contrary, we confess to those who are like us and who share our weaknesses. This means that we do not want to correct ourselves or to be improved. For that, first of all, we should have to be judged and found wanting. All we need is to be pitied and encouraged in our course. In short, we would like at the same time to be no longer guilty and not to make the effort to purify ourselves. However, the final twist of the story comes when he finally reveals the true intent of this entire um, monologue confession to the anonymous reader. He says, I was the lowest of the low, then imperceptibly my speech slips from I to we. When I get to the point of saying this is what we are, the switch has been made and I can tell them some home truths. Of course, unlike them, we're all in the same boat, but I have one superiority over them, which is that I know, and that gives me the right to speak. The more I accuse myself, the more I have the right to judge you. Better still, I incite you to judge yourself. So this is the core reason why he calls himself the judge penitent, which he um, gave us his word at the beginning of the novel. In a metafictive move, he says, 
The main thing is to be able to let oneself do anything while from time to time loudly declaring one's unworthiness. I allow myself everything once again at this time without laughing. I haven't changed my way of life. I still love myself and I still use other people. It's just that confessing my sins permits me to start again with a lighter heart and to gratify myself twice. Firstly, enjoying my nature and then a delicious repentance. But in the end, we come to the realization that we have been utterly used by him. He did not want to repent. He just wanted kind of like an outlet to make himself feel good about continuing on in the rotten way that he is. The next book is Theodore Fontaine's Effie Priest. It's a book of German realism in the 19th century and basically I was randomly walking past secondhand bookstores and I picked it up without any knowledge of the author of the book beforehand. It just like the blurb in the back just looked interesting and I was glad I made this choice. So basically it's a book about the nature of marital relationships in the 19th century and you can see parallels between it and other works such as like Anna Karenina or Madame Bovary. It's all about a beautiful young woman marrying a very like traditional, rather boring, but much older and wealthier man, and unsurprisingly, she cheats. The key emphasis in this book is really about the tension between personal desires and social norms or codes of honour. For example, after discovering the protagonist Effie's affair, her husband Instaten, I hope I haven't butchered his German name, but I'm just gonna pronounce it like that, um, decides to call a duel with the other man, Krampus, because there's something that has developed in our social existence, it's there and we have become accustomed to judging everything according to its laws and disregarding it is not possible. Society would despise us and eventually we would despise ourselves as well and be unable to bear it and blow our brains out. The world is the way it is and things don't proceed the way we want them to, but the way others want them to. Our code of honour is worship of a false idol, but we have to submit as long as the idol rules. It's kind of like he feels obliged to call the duel, not really out of his own personal rage. But because kind of those really superfluous rules of honour says that he must do it, and he does it like six years after the affair ended. Similarly, after learning of the affair, her family cast her off, and in her mother's letter she writes, The world in which you have lived will be close to you. Your parental home will also be close to you. We cannot offer you a quiet corner in Hohenkremen, a refuge in a house, or that would mean shutting the house off from all the world, and we are definitely not inclined to do that. Simply because we must nail our colours to the mast and show all the world our condemnation of what you did. The other central theme in this book is how those rigid values about how one should be or like what one should want or value creates a confusion of desires and sense of self within Effie as a young woman and ultimately it is this confusion that leads to her tragedy. From the beginning we see that she says love comes first but immediately after that comes esteem and honour and then comes diversion always something new always something to make me laugh or cry what it comes to is boredom. She idealises love but similarly places high value on esteem and honour and these are the two main factors driving her to marry Instaten because he is a respected civil servant. She says she cannot stand boredom. And I think this is actually the key motive that's like driving all her actions but it's very underplayed in her awareness because all the social values that she's been inculcated with do not include overt boredom. The really interesting thing however is that her mother similarly acknowledges she's not one of those people who are really focused on love. She'll talk about it even with emphasis in a tone of conviction, but only because she's read somewhere that love is the highest thing, death is the most beautiful, the most wonderful, but there's the very little feeling in it. What does she have? A love of pleasure and ambition. Instanton is ill-equipped to provide the hourly little diversion of stimulus, anything that counts as boredom. It seems that Effie is actually fundamentally driven by innate desire to avert boredom, but she does not recognise that. And because she does not recognise that, she mistakenly thinks that she desires love or is very ambitious about the wealth and status that her husband could provide her. Her husband is very nice to her, albeit like somewhat overbearing due to the nature of his age and position, but she thinks she should already have everything she wanted within this marriage, so there's no reason why she's like discontent. But the thing is, she is in a state of other confusion about what she wants, and she doesn't recognise the fact that she's bored. And this failure to recognise that really pushes her into a state. She was capable of strong feelings, she wasn't a strong character, she lacked the persistence, and all her good intentions would fade away, so she just drifted on at first because she couldn't change things, then because she didn't want to change them. Effie, free and open by nature, more and more came to live in a life in which she was acting out a part. Only one thing did she stay true to herself, she saw everything clearly and didn't try to gloss over anything. And that was like the key reason why she was let into the affair with Krampus. He gave her the stimulus that she had always wanted. In the meantime, she knew she did not love him, but it was like she was just irrevocably drawn into it. And she never gave a clear explanation of why she was involved with him. And it turned out probably she herself um, doesn't really understand either. It's more like she's driven by something that she doesn't really understand. In the end of the novel, I think it's a rather cathartic ending and a really heartwarming one because her parents took her back in again and she stopped presenting her husband, realising that the door and what drove her to the affair initially was none of his fault 
and he's merely another victim of society. Her husband also recognised that it was quite silly and wrong of him to live as if holding those honours as like the highest doctrines. The next book is called Philosophy and the Novel by Peter Jones. It's a work of literary criticism and the small novels analysed in this book in four different chapters. However, I'm going to be talking about the two of them because I have really read like the full text of the other two. Basically, I will start with the second chapter, which is called Passion and Action in Anna Karenina. And basically, Jones believes that Tolstoy's book discusses two central questions. Number one is what is to be done? And number two is what is the meaning and significance of the situation? And that is what the characters have to cope with. He also identifies two terms, actio, what a man is both conscious and in control of, and passio, emotional states and thoughts which possess or take control of him together with the habits and what he does unwittingly. So basically when the characters fall into the control of the latter rather than the former, it makes them unable to consciously navigate two questions posed above. For example, characters are rarely said to know or even think something, on the contrary they are more frequently said to not know or realise or consider or understand. And I think this is really true of Anna Karenina because when, I remember when I watched the film version, it was the Russian film version, and I was actually really annoyed because throughout the entire film, this one phrase that Anna kept saying is Yane Pani Mao, which is basically I do not understand in Russian, and I just had that phrase repeated over and over and over again, and that left such a strong impression on me. What Tolstoy seems to say is that not only passion hinders one's access to um, understanding the two central questions, and this is the case of Anna, but in the case of Karenin, um, a sense of social role playing also hinders that access. Clear but simple rules necessary for the performance of roles cannot provide for the contingencies of life. The continued exercise of rule bound responses atrophies the natural capacities for those spontaneous responses which may carry one through a crisis. Karen, in whose life had been geared to professional ambition, felt totally isolated in his misery because he failed to find the ordinance to which the newly arisen situation was subject. So, as a summary of how one really should act and like navigate oneself with respect to the two aspects, the actio and the passio, Jones writes, the key to right action is thus not controlled thoughts and spontaneous passion, but rather spontaneous thought in accord with conscience and controlled passion, where the latter expression refers to the realisation of those passions, alone which conscience sanctions. And then we have the fourth chapter, which is called Knowledge and Illusion in In Search of Lost Time. I'm not going to pronounce the French title because I know I will butcher it, so I'm just going to stick with the English one. And basically this chapter discusses the most central theme in Proust's work, which is our access to knowledge. The narrator believes that we have three faculties, our senses, our imagination, our intellect. A fourth faculty, memory, is variously described as oscillating between imagination and intellect, and now as associated with imagination and now with intellect. Proust also offers four obstacles to this access to knowledge, which are egoism, passion, intellect, and habit. The novel largely surrounds the concept of what we do and do not know about other people, and in particular, the operations of our desire resist our consciousness, let alone our analysis, primarily because they seek above all to be satisfied. It is always an ideal person, that is to say, an imaginary one, that we love. Because ideals associated with the unattainable and the unattainable itself causes the desire for its possession. The thought of an ideal creates the desire for the possession of it. And desire is a function of the largely unknown increases with the uncertainty of the attainment of its object. We love only the inaccessible. What about the role of memory? So here Proust contends, Voluntary memory does not preserve the past itself, but only isolated instants from the past, the record of which may be doubly distorted. First, by the initial perceptions themselves, a function of our interests at the time, secondly, by our interests in remembering them now. The idea here is that we receive stimuli and use the combined forces of imagination, intellect, and involuntary recollection to construct a person and that is like the person that we think we know in this construction we are actually like hindered from forming an accurate portrait of the subject due to the obstacles that um, Proust has mentioned above yet the ultimate failure of our ability to reconstruct another person actually lies in this fundamental fact if things are mental constructions out of our impressions a sense we convert on those things will be inseparable from those impressions so we must fundamentally always rely on impressions and that's why we just never really, really know the person. I had just started this book, like a collection of short stories by Franz Kafka um, near the end of the month, and so far I finished a short story collection called Contemplations and another short story called The Judgment. I think Judgment's very famous. And I love Kafka so much. I think his stories are really thought provoking and sharp in a subdued way. Um, I've never tried them before, so I first try. So out of contemplation, there are a few of my favourite stories. The first one is called Resolutions. So basically the speaker talks about a resolution to rouse himself from misery and sluggishness, but after like a brief 
Our struggle ultimately succumbs to a sort of unfeeling mundanity. And he says, the best advice remains to take what comes to behave like some sluggish mass, and even if one should feel oneself being blown away, not to be tempted into one superfluous sort of step. Crush out with one's hands whatever ghostly particle of life remains, that is, to intensify the final piece of the grave and not to allow anything else. A second story was called The Businessman. I think on the surface, most people would read it as saying that the protagonist is unhappy despite of his wealth. Um, I have a different take. I would like to read it as despite the fact that he's lonely and tired, he is financially successful. So just dwell on the twist, on the difference. And I think it's really worth noting that there's more than one way you can understand it. And the next one is called The Man Running Past. It's basically such a brilliant portrayal of apathy in humans while we really tend to find ways to smooth our conscience over it. Now, the judgment. I think I absolutely loved the judgment. I think it has so many layers of complexity and there's no single way to read it. It opens with the protagonist George writing a letter to his unnamed friend who left to do business in Russia three years ago. And they've been in correspondence ever since, but his friend always said that um, he could not return to visit for business reasons and his business is struggling and he's living as a lonely bachelor. We see a curious dynamic between George and his friend because George seems to feel a sense of guilt for like living a good life among friends and family and even um, eventually like recently he got engaged to the woman he loves and he's reluctant to share those good aspects of his life with his friend nor suggests that his friend comes back because it may be better for him because it almost seems like he feels guilty for doing better than his friend and he is like vicariously living in the shame of loneliness and failed business venture like by casually experiencing this for his friend. And then there's like the really also um, really interesting relationship dynamics between him and his father and I would almost describe this as gaslighting, like my own interpretation, because his father first questions whether his friend exists at all and that is like casting doubt on his sanity, um, but later says, oh, that I've in fact written to your friend in secrecy informing him of all the details of your life that you don't want to tell him, that really like crushes George's sense of self and his relationship with his friend. And then we also see that George feels a combination of guilt at not taking care of his father properly, but also it's clearly that he has fear and hatred towards this bullying figure. Yeah, and it's just very complex and most people think the story is a reflection of Kafka's struggle between like the lonely bachelor lifestyle which he believes necessary for writing, but also his unavoidable attraction to worldly sensual pleasures as represented by his fiancée. Also, it is reflecting his complex relationship with his father who has always been like a domineering figure in his life. And finally, like the judgment of drowning himself that his father gives him in the end and he abides to is very interesting. And I think I'm going to leave it open for interpretation. It's kind of like the question of did he abide to it because his father played into his sense of guilt? Or is it for other reasons that is very open for interpretation? So in conclusion, I just wanted to mention Republic by Plato, which I mentioned last month, is still on the radar, hasn't fallen off the radar, um, I'm still on it. I'm on the ninth book now, so I will finish it very soon and make a video on it sometimes this month. Um, I quite enjoyed all the books that I've chosen to read this month. I think it was a very successful train of choices. Anyways, if you enjoyed my video, don't forget to like and subscribe.